We're going to read just a few verses in John 9, 35 uh, through 38. And uh, try to look at, again at the subject, it is he. John 9, 35. Jesus heard they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. I like that. The talketh with thee coupled with seeing him, because that's how I got my sight, was by the word giving me faith. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the person of the word. And that's where I got my sight to see the Son and believe on Him. And He said, Lord, I believe. And He worshiped Him. And Father, we do thank You today for the merciful kindness of God to men of low estate. We do thank You, Lord, that even though You have determined to come unto us from all of Your existence, You have always purposed to come unto us. But there had to be a mediator because You are so great. And anything created, even though like the cherubim, or cherubim, designed to stand in their presence, in thy presence, they have to cover their face with their, their wings to shield them from your glory, even though they were created to be there. Creation and creator has a vast uh, difference, Lord, and, and we need a mediator. And... You determined that you would fulfill everything that we needed to come to you. We thank you for the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, our Savior, thy Son, the eternal Son of God, who was raised up together with you and was daily your delight. We thank you for thy Son. We praise and adore and worship him and know that we have come to know you by knowing him and that that which we shall see of thy glory in eternity will be in the face of the man Christ Jesus and we praise you and worship you for it we're striving O Lord to venture out into those great waters of the glorious mystery of thy person Lord you know that great and learned men fail at this much less an ignorant little unlearned and unschooled country boy like myself cannot fathom this but Lord this is what you gave me to look at and I pray that you'd help me now so that people would know that you do condescend to men of low estate that you do approach mankind that you are determined to come unto us and seek us out like you did this blind man and manifest yourself to us in in your holy person and say to us very plainly uh, thou hast both seen him and it is he that speaks to you now speak to us now Lord open the eyes of God's people take the scales away Lord let us look full in thy wonderful face and let the things of this world and the aggravations and trials of life even the joys that we have because of inordered affections grow strangely dim in the light of thy glory and grace. Prepare us now to come into thy eternal presence. It won't be long till the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more, and we shall be called into the presence of the great Lamb of God. And I pray that you would not let this last generation, uh, Lord, be any way deficit of preparation for thy glorious presence. May we not come before you with with filthy uh, ra rags righteousness or lord or, or spot or blemish or any such thing but you would because of your love for your bride make us without spot or blemish so that you might present us unto thyself prepare us now to see thy glory so that it would not be a great transition from uh, the last generation those who are alive and remain should be caught up with them that have long been dead. And Lord, help us that shall not have the benefit and the filtering agent of physical death 
that we might have the filtering agent of the precious Word of God ministered by the Holy Spirit, the anointing oil of the Holy Ghost. Bathe us in thy glory. Lift us up, O oh God, I pray, that we as a bride would not, Lord, be incompatible with the bridegroom. Save us from looking at the glory and cause us to look upon the face of our bridegroom to glorify him. Help us to eye not our garment, but our dear bridegroom's face. And grant, Lord Jesus, that we would even now rise up, O men of God, and have done with lesser things and be made conscious of our position of sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Grant that this might be so, for it is your purpose and will, and it is our desire. For we ask these things, trusting, believing, hoping, and Lord, looking for them in Christ's name. Amen. Luke chapter 22, excuse me, Luke chapter 10 and verse number 22. Luke chapter 10 and verse number 22. How can I know God? Jesus Christ has alluded to himself and pertaining to his former glory. He talked about the love that I had with thee, Father, before the world began. He talked about the glory that I had with thee before the world began. He talked about that I have uh, an awareness of where I came from. Therefore, awareness of where I go. And he began to have uh, the goodness to be able to put these things into the scriptures as he began to grow in wisdom and knowledge before Almighty God. The crescendo comes to its height as recorded in John 18, 4, and Jesus knowing all things. So he didn't have to ask the learned doctors anymore as he did when he was a child. He didn't have to be taken to the synagogue and hear the rabbis read. He didn't need Mary or Joseph to talk to him and teach him about the things of God. He had that inner spirit, that same teacher you have. The school books, the schoolhouse, the school teacher, all on the inside, that is by the Holy Ghost. And they shall all be taught of God. There will be no ignorant children of God. There will not be uh, a single child of God without the awareness of who God is and what they are in Him. How good God is to us. How can we remain ignorant when His name is the Word? How can we remain ignorant when it says Christ is the wisdom of God? How can there be anything so powerful to bring us down away from the awareness of God and His glory when it says Christ is the power of God. He will overcome all darkness. He will overcome all ignorance. He will overcome every pretense and supposition that is not of God and bring you into a place where the crooked places are straightened and the high places are lowered and the low places are made high and the and, and, and the highway shall be prepared for the king of glory to make entrance into your soul. You shall not have it to stutter or stumble when speaking to Abraham or Isaac or David or, or the learned uh, Solomon or whoever in eternal glory. For you shall be able to speak to Christ himself. And Christ himself will be your mind. Because this mind shall be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You shall be able to enunciate freely without reservation and without ignorance and without stumbling or without lack of confidence. Not with pride or braggadocious or acting like you need to speak to show who you are, but because there is a river that flows from your soul that causes you to speak pertaining the glory of God. Out of his mouth shall flow, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. The angel shall have to listen to you as you speak of your love throughout all eternity. They do not know what you know by experience. They know right now more than we know by knowledge. But they have no experience and therefore they shall desire, they do desire, to, the, the angels desire to look in, into these things. But how do you know God? How can you come to know him? God is unknowable in his essence. But here is how we know him. In Luke chapter 10 and verse number 22, all things are delivered to me of my Father. 
And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father. The only one person in the entirety of, uh, of existence that completely, fully knows, personally knows uh, the Son is the Father. Now I want you to notice those two words. You can be a man and not be a father. But if you have a son, you are a father. There is an issuance here. We are regenerated. Christ Jesus generated and came forth from the Father. What are you saying? I don't know. I just know how to say it. There is that, there is that oneness there. That no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son. You cannot know God apart from Jesus Christ. You cannot know Christ apart from the God the Father. And he to whom the Son will reveal him. The Son has the ability to reveal the Father. Show us the Father and it will suffice us. Look at me, Jesus said. Have I been so long with you and thou hast not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. For I and the Father are one. So we come to understand that knowing the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is by the Father drawing us. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb. I hope I know what this verse is. Uh, John 6, 44. Yes, that's it. I hadn't thought about that verse in 92 years. And there it is. All right. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Do you know Christ? Then you are drawn of the Father. Isn't that good? Like a man draws a sword. Or like the disciples drew the net up on shore full of fish. So God drew you. Purposely. Emphatically. Literally. Completely. Eternally. Knowledgeably. God drew you to his son. And then how did you know God? The father said the son will reveal me to you. Isn't that good? God's all into this thing. You know that? Yeah. You're going to know God. And God loves you and ain't nothing you can do about it. Isn't that good? Right. Woo, I can hear my enemies getting hold of that. Fool on you. I'm going to preach. I'm just, go away. Leave me alone. Listen, John chapter 1 and verse 14. John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. That's the only way I understand John 8, 12. What does that say? I am the light of the world. Well, I, I, I know there it says in Genesis, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And there is the manifestation and bringing forth of the person of the Son of God. The Word, God said, the light, I am the light of the world, the Son and manifest himself but dear soul the rabbits and the trees and you know and the monkeys and all that stuff they don't know who the lord is and mankind could not know till god came and stood in the door of abraham's tent until he manifest himself in in flesh when god came and began to manifest himself uh, it was a pre a pre appearance of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Mm. Capital W. I, I, I've had some few occasions of great, famous, rich, influential men. But they never did want to come where, live where I did. You could meet them down at the assigned building, whether it was religious or not, church house or, you know, state capital or something like that. But not this one. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And, but something was very special about him. We had anointed eyes because we and some others did not. We beheld his glory. There's something different about this man. 
No man speaketh like this man. No man ever died like this man. No man, no man ever lived like this man. And we beheld his glory. What did it make you understand that glory that you saw him? He's the only one can reveal the Father to you. So when you saw his glory, it revealed to you that his glory was the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father. So I saw the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ was brought to God. Oh, my soul. He dwelt among us full of grace. I needed that because I was a sinner and full of truth. I needed that because after he saved me, I was full of ignorance and darkness, and I needed, I needed the light to come upon my soul and to bring an awareness of, of, of God completely. We've been quoting this. Let's just read it. It won't hurt nothing. John 14 and verse 9. John 14 and verse number 9. It, it won't hurt us. John 14, 9. Philip saith in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be sufficient. That's all you have to do. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet, even during this long time, you still hadn't come to know me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how, you, how sayest thou then, show us the Father? I am the revelation of God. They used to run around with these Initials on them all the time. WWJD. What would Jesus do? I said, well, I know one thing. Whatever he did, that's what God did. He, he brings God out in the open so you can see him. What does God feel about sinners? Look at Jesus. What does God think about this, that, and the other? Look at Jesus. What is God's idea about uh, 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 these different things that puzzle men? Look at Jesus. Because if you see him... You see the Father. Here's another one that we've been quoting. It won't hurt us to turn to. 1 Timothy 3, 16. 1 Timothy 3, 16. You say, preach on something without any controversy. Okay, here it is. 1 Timothy 3, 16. And without controversy, Right? There ain't no controversy in this. I don't care who you are. It don't make no difference what denominational shingle is hanging out there on, on, on your front gate. This old, it makes no difference whether you, whatever you call yourself, this is without controversy. Every son of Adam bows right here. Without controversy. Great is the mystery of of godliness. Now what are we talking about? Read the first phrase. No, read the first phrase. <laughs> the incarnation, right? The mystery of godliness. God manifesting himself to humankind. What, what kind of mystery is it? It's a great mystery. You can know it, but you can't fully know it. You can't know it except God reveal it to you. No man knows the Father but the Son, and no man knows the Son but the Father, and he to whom he will reveal him. Listen, God was manifest in the flesh. That's, that's amazing. The invisible I am manifested in human flesh, justified in the Spirit. The Holy Ghost backed up everything he said. He justified him. You know, he said, I, I, I am the light. The blind became, the Holy Spirit gave the blind their sight, whether physical or spiritual. Uh, uh, blessed are they that hunger and thirst. He's the bread of life. Everything, he said, Lazarus come forth, and he that was dead came forth. The Holy Spirit justified him as being God like no one else had ever been justified. Seen of angels. You say, well, is that a big deal? Can you prove to me the angels actually saw him before his incarnation? Every place I find that there is an appearance of, uh, of God in the angels, it said there's a form of a man sitting up on that throne in Ezekiel, right? It's, it's suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heaven. How's, that, how's the angels going to know about Jesus? 
The manifold wisdom of God is going to be manifest by the church to the principalities and powers. Book of Colossians. I can't remember if it's chapter 2 or 3. You look it up. I think it's 310, but you have to look it up. They, 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 the first time to see God. Listen. Scene of angels. Angels came and ministered to him after his temptation. And, and then they were ready. They, they all stood at attention, got right up there to the line, ready to go. But he wouldn't call on them. Forty days without food. And the devil said, you know what? Cast yourself down. The angels will pick you up in this, this one temptation over here. You cause these stones to be made bread, and he wouldn't do it. Wouldn't, we wouldn't work a miracle. Okay, well, cast yourself down. The angels will come pick you up. Yes, sir, we're ready. Wouldn't call on them. Got to the cross. The angel said, he, he's dying. He's dying. We was there at his birth. Now we are here at his death. He's dying. And he said, don't you know that I could call 12 legions of angels? I said, yes, sir, we're ready to go. Sit down, boys. Stand down. I'm doing this by myself. Scene of angels. Isn't that amazing? Preached unto the Gentiles. Glory to God. That's how I got in. Amen. Preached unto the Gentiles. That's a mystery of godliness. Why would God want to preach to us old dumb dog Gentiles? Because he loved us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Amen. I have another flock that you don't know, you Jewish boys. Move over. There's another flock that I have, and I'm going to call them. Paul said, I'm, I'm, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world. Who believed on him? Everybody that he called, plus the angels, believed on in the world. Amazing. Believed on in the world. Mr. Smarty Pants, atheist, talks about that little invisible friend y'all got that y'all talk to all the time. Yeah, but, you know, you don't represent the mystery of godliness. We do. We believe on him in the world. Isn't that great? Amen. You, you remember what I tried to tell you about that blind baby born in, as seen in John chapter 9? Blind baby born of Jewish parents in the middle of all that zealous religion? Yeah, why did he do that? That it was an issue to the disciples. This man, who sinned? This man or his parents? He was born blind. The disciples said that. The, the Jews said it. Uh, thou art altogether born in sin. But why was he there in all that? Because God would say one of the few times that he would ever say to anybody, It is he that speaketh to thee. I am the Son of God. It would give God an opportunity to bespeak his person and manifest himself to that man. Did it work? He said, you know what, if I, if I was to know who it was, I guarantee you I'd fall down and worship him and believe on him. He said, okay, let me give it a shot. It's me. And said, so what did he do? He believed on the Lord and worshiped him. Did exactly what he said. Ain't God good. Believed on in the world. And then... Where is he now? Where is he now? He's at the right hand of God, right? Hebrews 1.3, after he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He hadn't, he hadn't ceased to be. He's just gone to save your place. Standing in line at Judy's and waiting on your grids and the line's backed up and the fellow said, I heard him turn around and whisper to us, I gotta go to the restroom and said, hold my place. And he comes back in a few minutes drying his hands off and he said, okay, where are you? He said, I'm over here, get right here in this line. Saved his place. And I think, you know what? I got somebody saving my place for something better than grits. Right. And son, they ain't much better than grits as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but there, there's one saving a place received up into glory do you realize that if God received him and he at the cross and at Pentecost married his bride the church and these two become one if he's there you're there too 
seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ain't no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'm preaching to you today an absolute sure salvation where God knows about it. I know on our side that we have to work it out with fear and trembling, but on God's side, it's done, son. I mean, it, can't not, it cannot be undone. There ain't nobody big enough to do anything about it because God is absolute creator God, and he's locked it in. Ain't God good? My soul. I want to tell you something. Can I just tell you something? I found this uh, Flemish Jesuit theologian. Can you imagine anybody like me running into a Flemish Jesuit theologian? His name is Leonardus Lysias. He was born before me. He was born in 1554. And he died in 1623. I want to read you something he said. I don't really quote a lot of people. But if I think it's going to help you, if it's for your edification, I'm going to bring it to you. Well, this is from him, okay? Don't make me say his name again. But all right. Quote, Deity, God, is united with humanity, as fire is united with iron. Think about it. You've watched Bonanza and that old board down at the, down at the big old muscles, that leather apron pulling on that handle up and down and got that horseshoe over there in that fire getting it red hot. You, you've seen iron get red hot with fire, haven't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, that's what we're talking about. Stay with me. The fire conditions the iron throughout, but it remains distinct. The horseshoe is still a horseshoe, and the fire is still a fire, but the horseshoe's got the fire in it now. Fire gives the iron light, heat, and purity, so you cannot distinguish one from the other. Now did that iron have light before? No. Did, did it have heat? No. Was it as pure as it is with the fire throughout it? No. But is the horseshoe or the iron, let me stick with the iron, is the iron fire? No. Is the fire iron? No. Okay. Yet they are two distinct natures. But fire makes the iron incapable of rust or blackness. Hello. While that iron is red hot with that fire, it won't rust. Jesus Christ could do no sin because he had the fire of God. Our God is a consuming fire within him. He had the fullness of the Holy Ghost in him. And there wasn't no way he could ever be black. He was red hot. And the operation of each of their natures is attributed to the other. Iron with the fire in it can heat and burn. I had an old boy who used to do my front end alignment. <clears throat> and he had a listening independent shop, concrete floor, pull your car in here. And that big old hole in the middle where you drove over the hole and he'd get down in there and do all that stuff he did. And the way he kept his shop heated, he had a big old uh, barrel, metal barrel, of used motor oil with a spigot on it. You know what a spigot is, don't you? Right. <clears throat> he had it turned on just enough drip, 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 and he had a pile of iron, all kinds of stuff. I don't know what it was. Old brake liners, I don't know what it was. Any else. Old car parts, made out of iron, piled up where that oil would drip 
drip, drip on that iron, and he would light it in the morning. And all that iron would get red hot and start glowing. I didn't have any idea you could heat a place like that. And I thought, what in the world am I looking at? And now all these years later, here I am up here telling you about what God showed me way back down yonder. He said, son of man, come down to the potter's house. I got something I want to show you there. He said, Brother Gene, I'm going to let you hit this hole in the road and, and knock your car out of line so you have to go down yonder. I believe it. Amen. So I'll be ready to tell you that that iron had light and it had heat. You touch it, son, it'd burn you. But that's the attribute of fire, not iron. Right? So one of them's characteristics would be attributed to the other. Now, if that iron was a sword, and you had it heated, and you were working on it, that fire could be said to cut and to pierce. Fire can't cut, but if it's in that iron, it can. And this, it, I think he kind of wanders off a little bit right here, but you understand what, he's, what he means. I don't think there's ever any, any, any imperfections in Christ. But he says, the imperfections of the iron do not affect the fire. I can receive that from me, but not about Christ. I believe that whatever I am, that is a sinner saved by grace. A sinner dead in trespasses and sins. The Holy Spirit is not made to be less or to be tarnished because he's in me. I get it like that, can't you? Imperfections of the iron do not affect the fire. So that things belonging to his divinity are ascribed to his humanity. Unquote. Don't you think that was worth bringing to you? Good, I thought it was. That's amazing. I, I don't think I would have ever seen that, even though I saw it, but I didn't know what I was looking at, and God had to wait all these years to get me caught up to where I could see and have understanding of what this brother said. Now, we fixing to put it in a different gear right now. And this is going to be kind of a show and tell from this point on. And I know I went 10 minutes over this morning, so I owe you 10 minutes. So I'm going to take 20 minutes over today to make up for it. I mean, this afternoon. Get your Bibles. <clears throat> I want to show you the iron and the fire. I want to show you the deity and the humanity. I want to show you in your Bible, sitting in your lap, been in your possession ever since you've been saved, Nothing wild, weird, nothing, you know, wild gourds put in the pot, but just your daily bread and show you your God. But you're going to have to work to do it because we're going to have to turn to a heap of scriptures. Are you ready? <clears throat> John 8, 23. John chapter 8 and verse 23. The first verse will be the deity, and then we'll follow it up by what is absolutely true but sounds completely contradictory to it, which is the humanity. Are you ready? John 8, 23. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above, ye are of this world, I am not of this world. And in John 10, 30, you don't need to turn there. It says, I and the Father are one. Right. So in his divinity, he can tell you, I am not of this world. And I am from above. But look at Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 5. And let's look at the other side of that coin and see his humanity. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Here's a different mind in the humanity of Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, listen, 
but made himself of no reputation. I am from above, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. I am not of this world, but he took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the habit, the fashion, as a man, he humbled himself, he humbled himself, I am not of this world, yet here he is humbled, for what purpose? And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So here is one that says, I am from above, I and the Father are one, I am not of this world, but yet here he is humbled, obedient to death, and no reputation. It's the same person. There's no difference. You can see both of them. I and the Father are one. The Father is greater than I. It depends on whether you're looking at his deity or his humanity. Are you looking at the fire or the iron? But when they're both together, there is no incompatibility. Isn't that amazing? 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built it. Solomon had sense enough to know that earth wouldn't hold him. The heaven of heavens can't hold him. And sure this temple couldn't hold him. That's his deity. Now, while we're here, look at Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. <clears throat> Will God indeed dwell on earth? Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name, what? Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Well, I want to ask you a question. You say he's Emmanuel, God with us. I want to ask you a question. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? How can the heaven of heavens contain him? The earth can't contain him. And you're telling me that he's going to dwell with you. No, no incompatibility. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. All I'm trying to do is open up your minds to see the vastness of the mystery of godliness. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Read me the next phrase. He went about doing good. He did what doing good? Went about. Went about. Went about where? Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, the earth. Right? But we just read the heavens of heavens can't contain him. And God can't dwell on earth. He, you can't contain God on earth. But here he is going about on earth. And uh, just a little minute portion of earth, by the way. <laughs> he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. God was Emmanuel to him. God with him. And just like he is Emmanuel to us. Can you say that Jesus went about doing good on the earth? Yep. 
Can you also ask the alliterative question, can the earth contain God? Or does God dwell on earth? And the answer is no, it can't fully contain him. But yet here he is. And yet there, there, is, there, there is no the confusion about the two. Daniel chapter 7. The book of Daniel chapter 7. Tell me the title of God. I know Daniel was in my Bible when I left home this morning. There it is. Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 9. We won't read it all if you can give me a title of God. The A of D. The Ancient of Days. In verse 13, give me a title for God. The Ancient of Days. How about in verse number 22? Ancient of days. Some of you just went ahead and hollered that one out because you knew that was going to be the answer. <laughs> you hadn't even found verse 22 yet. You did good. What does that mean? He's always been. He's the ancient of days. In, in Revelation, let me just, I'll help you with this without you having turned to it. Revelation 21, 6 and 22, 13. I am the B and the E. beginning and the end he was the one that began the beginning well he had to be there if he had to begin it and he was the one that will end in the end so he's going to be going on when the end is here he's going to be continuing on he was there before it, everything began it just says in beginning God did so and so that means in beginning to work it don't mean in beginning of God God didn't begin he's always been so he's the ancient of days. He's the beginning and the end. Now look at Luke 22 in verse 37. Luke 22, 37. When I stop, you read me the rest of it, okay? Luke twenty two thirty seven. 37. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me now how are you going to handle that? Can the earth contain God? Can God dwell on the earth? The heaven of heavens can't contain him, but he went about doing good. He is the Ancient of Days. Three times we read that. And in Revelation, twice it says he's the beginning and the end. And yet here it is saying the things of me have an end. How are you going to handle that? Because when he had accomplished what he was supposed to do, he said it is finished. And then he was received back into glory. So the things of his humanity and that which he was supposed to do within the revelation and the and the exercise of that humanity were accomplished and it, therefore it came to an end. But the ancient of days became the infant of days. Wow. That's your God. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifested in the flesh. Hold your place in Luke. In fact, it'll be Luke chapter 2. And uh, let's go back over to Psalm 104. Psalm 104 and verse 2. Psalm 104 and verse number 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. All right. He's clothed with honor and majesty. Verse 2. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. What is he covered with? Glory and honor. Covereth thyself with light 
as with a garment. Now, Luke chapter 2 and verse number 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son. Oh, my soul. Would you? I can't hardly stand it. Read me that next phrase. Any of you, any of your dear students of the Bible know what swaddling clothes are? They're just pieces of cloth. They didn't have no sleeves in them or no legs. These weren't no little cutie footy pajamas that she got at the shower. She didn't get a shower. She just had rags. Cover thyself with light as with a garment. Clothed with honor and majesty yeah. came to be wrapped in rags in a stinking horse barn, cow barn. My goodness. There's going to be a whole lot more to praise God for in eternity than ever I thought. Is this widening your comprehension of God? Is this widening your comprehension that you can't comprehend God? Is this making you love the vastness of God and make you understand that whatever it is that's bothering you in life don't amount to a hill of beans compared when you see the, the vastness of God and know that He's obligated himself to you. Man. Th that's amazing, ain't it? Hold on to Luke 2 and let's go to 1 Corinthians 1.24. 1 Corinthians 1.24. The last two phrases in this verse tells you that Christ is something blank of God. It's what? And unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the what? And the wisdom. All right. Christ is God's power and Christ is God's wisdom. Now think about it. God's wisdom. You can't teach God anything. But listen at this. While you're in Luke 2, read that verse 51 to me, will you? Luke 2, 51. Christ is the power of God. And both of these are going to be in here. And the wisdom of God. Luke 2, 51 and 52. Just read it all. Luke 2, 51 and 52. Do you see that word subject in verse 51? Listen, if, if, if you were the king of the world, the lord of the earth, the potentate, the high potentate of all humanity, would anybody be able to tell you what to do? He is, you, you understand this now, the power of God not in God but of God he, him and God have the exact same power and in verse 51 it says in his humanity he was subject under not the queen mother in the mighty palace overlooking kingdoms but a little old virgin that had a bad reputation because she had a baby out of wedlock. And a, and a working father who had to make his living by, by carpentry work. Subject unto them. But he was the power of God. And then he was the wisdom of God. And it says in verse 21 that he didn't avail himself to that wisdom all at once because he was made like unto his brethren. 
and and the pathway of the just is like the shining sun shining more and more into the perfect day and you learning and growing every day in the revelation of God and one thing leads to another and God prefaces what you're going to learn today by what happened to you yesterday and so he was made like unto his brother and he gradually revealed his own wisdom to his humanity can you fathom that I can't but he was the power and wisdom of God but here we see he was subject and he was growing in wisdom. Psalm 50 and verse 12. Psalm 50 and verse 12. <clears throat> I can't get this Bible to turn this. I just started using it. The brand new Bible just started using it the other week. Psalm 50 and verse 12. This is God speaking. If I were hungry, if I were hungry, didn't say I was, but if I was, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Can God be hungry? I don't think so. If he was, he wouldn't tell us. The only reason you tell somebody you're hungry is because you're saying, I don't know what you're running on, but I've done running out of, I'm running out of fuel. My stomach's growling over here. I want something to eat. That's the reason you tell folks you're hungry. But he said, I won't tell you. But look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And even the devil tried to get in on this. Verse 2 and 3. You want to read it? Matthew 4, 2 and 3. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. The devil knew he was hungry. That's his humanity. And what did he say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He wouldn't drink on the cross except it fulfilled the scriptures, and he wouldn't eat here in this temptation. I have not never gone 40 days without eating. I have never hardly gone 40 hours without eating. 40 minutes and maybe I want a snack. <laughs> But the Bible said he wasn't hungered. And then it says in Psalm 15, verse 12, that if I were hungry, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you. Isn't that amazing? You want me to just read these to you? Or you want to keep looking them up? Do you want me to keep reading these to you? I mean, you want me to read these to you myself? Or you want to keep looking them up? Okay, question number one. Do you want me to read these to you? No. No. Oh, you want to keep looking them up? Yeah. Okay. All right, Isaiah 57 and verse 15. I just got 82 more. Oh. Okay, read them yourself. Yeah, okay. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one, the high one, the lofty one, capital O, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Go to Matthew eleven twenty nine. If you don't get all these cross references, I've got them and I will be glad to let, make sure you get them. Matthew 11 and verse 21. I am the high and lofty one. My name is holy. There's nobody as high and glorious and lofty as this one is. Capital O. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Next phrase, please. 
for I made him a lowly in heart. Which one is he? High and lofty or low and meek? He's both. That's your God. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> Folks, uh, this study has made me try to watch myself and watch my mouth and watch my attitude. Because when, when you're spoiled like a Christian is and you find out God's love for you, you, if you don't watch out that flesh, you'll get proud and you'll smart off and then, mm, then you're in trouble, ain't you? Because pride always goes before fall. But here he was, the highest, most lofty, and the most holy one. But when he got here, he said, I am meek and lowly of heart. Come to me and learn of me. Learn of me. That's what I'm trying to do. And you shall find rest to your soul. Romans 11, verse 35. Romans 11. And this one really got to me. Romans 11 and verse 35. You got it? All right, read it to me. Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. All right. Who hath first given to God? Anybody? All right, look at Luke 8, 3. Luke 8, 3. Who hath first given to God? Luke 8, 3. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Mm. The foxes have what? Holes and the birds have? Yes. But the Son of Man hath nowhere. nowhere to lay his head. Who hath first given to God? Well, everything that is came forth from him Speaking it into existence. He don't need anything. But the humanity, women, folk, maybe widows, I don't know. One of them was a wife. The rest of them, I don't know. And many others, he depended on handouts. Hmm. That gets to me, folks. That gets to me. Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 10. Daniel 7 and verse number 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands, here's the word, ministered unto him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was said and books were open. Our time is gone. Matthew 20, 28. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him. Matthew chapter 20. In verse 28. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Verse 27. Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not, came not to be what? Yes. Ministered unto, but to minister, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Not just to give you what he had, but to give you what he was, to give his life. Our time's gone. I got two more pages of these, uh, maybe Wednesday night.
if if you like this, and Norm's already voted that y'all have to read them. So, isn't that amazing? The vastness of God. The vastness of God. The, the willingness to condescend. No smart aleckness in there. Yet. Do you know who I am? You can't ask me to do that. You have any idea who I am? No. He didn't ask that we know who he was. He told us he knew what we were. And if we didn't have no help, he didn't do something about it. Ain't God good.